Sometimes anti-communist propaganda is so hilarious it must be tackled head on. The American Thinker Institute has a man by the name of Paul Kengor who wrote a piece called Obama and the Marxist Communist View of Marriage and Abortion. This uh, is somehow supposed to prove that he is a Marxist or he's following a Marxist line. Now he is the executive director of the Center for Vision and Values at Grove City College, both of which are right-wing Christian fundamentalist institutions. Now he's going to make the argument that gay marriage and abortion are both communist conspiracies and that these are things that only communists want. Now I'm going to deal with it in two parts. The first part on gay marriage, the second on abortion. Conservatives are not shy about highlighting what they perceive as Marxist communist roots in various aspects of Barack Obama's policies, vision, and rhetoric. This is true, because they think everything is. On marriage, Obama last week finally came out of the closet in favor of gay marriage. This means that the current president of the United States possesses the most radical slash non-traditional view of marriage and family of any president in the 200 plus year history of this republic. Yes, think about that. That radical non-traditionalism is fully consistent with the Marxist communist worldview. In the Communist Manifesto, Marx several times wrote openly of the abolition of the family and of communism abolishing eternal truths and all religion and all morality. The communist revolution is the most radical rupture with traditional relations, Marx affirmed. Its development involves the most radical rupture with traditional ideas. Marx knew how shockingly revolutionary this was. He wrote abolition of the family, even the most radical flare-up at this infamous proposal of the communists. Yes, Marx did call for the abolition of the family. The abolition of the family. Now, well, he called for the abolition of marriages as well, as it is a contract of trading property. That is the roots of marriage in the religious context. Now, bringing about gay marriage wouldn't destroy marriages. It would create more marriages. So I don't see how you'd be ending the family by creating more families. However, I do agree that gay people should have the right to marry. If two people love each other and they do want to get married, then by all means they should. But you don't abolish the family by creating more marriages and thus creating more families. This would be antithesis to what Marx actually said. And you also have to keep in mind at the time Marx was homophobic, like everybody else was at the time. You'd be very, very hard pressed to find anybody anywhere in the world at the time who was progressive in that regard. Which is exactly like you people now, homophobic centuries later when the rest of the civilized world is not. Marx practiced what he preached. He was a terrible father who caused tremendous discord in his family. As the family nearly starved, and as Marx's long-suffering wife neared the breaking point, Marx began an affair with the family's young nursemaid, whom he impregnated. When the child was born, Marx refused to acknowledge its existence and his paternity. Uh, there's almost literally nothing to back up this claim that he had sex with a woman and fathered a child by her. There's just absolutely nothing reliable whatsoever to back that up. So what he's trying to do here is link the evil of the evils of infidelity to communism, as though communism is somehow the fault of infidelity. Now, as for why he was living in, and his family was living in poverty, because they were in hiding, because various governments through Europe were trying to kill him because of the ideas that he put forward. The fascists, who didn't like these ideas, wanted the man dead. That's why he was poor, because he was in hiding. The Bolsheviks, when they took over, immediately lifted the Russian Orthodox Church's long-standing prohibition against divorce. They also expunged God from wedding ceremonies, establishing so-called red weddings, that is purely secular wedding ceremonies. In short order, divorce skyrocketed to proportions never before seen in Russia's long history or anywhere in the world. Just within decades, Russians had divorce rates worse than the worst rates in recent American history. People got divorced because they wanted to get divorced. People have a right not to be married just as much as they have a right to be married. That term, right to marriage, right not to marriage, seems to be a problem with people like you who are against gay people getting married. People have a right to be married and not to be married. Women have a right to get divorced. Of course they legalized it because a woman has a right not to be married to a man if she doesn't want to. 
This was an extremely radical concept at the time because people like you, Christian fundamentalists, did not want that to happen and banned it. That's why it was legalized, because women have a right not to be married to you and not to be held as property either, which was the fundamental reason for a religious marriage. Now, of course, divorce rates went up because it was legalized, because people could now do it. That's why they went up. I don't even know what the point of even mentioning that is. It was the perfect communist plot, literally. They had sought to undo traditional notions of marriage and morality, and they succeeded wildly. Yes, because traditional notions of marriage are horribly repressive and misogynistic. They needed to be done away with it. People like you, I assume, given the traditional nature of uh, religious ceremonies, would prefer to use them to control women, which is what they were intended for. To be sure, a 1930 CPUSA member wasn't thinking about gay marriage, and the Russians certainly weren't. Nonetheless, all of them consistently, consciously undermined the traditional understanding of marriage. It was one of their targets. Yes, the CPUSA and the Bolsheviks weren't actually thinking about gay marriage. Yet, somehow, this is still tied to those communists being responsible for that. That's uh, very, very odd. Now, to summarize, Obama wants gay marriage. Obama wanting gay marriage is a communist conspiracy. Yet, you just said that the communists, the one that you keep pointing to as an example, uh, the CPUSA and the Soviet Union, weren't interested in gay marriage. Uh, that almost seems to be a contradictory point by you. And, of course, somehow, Obama wants gay marriage because communists supported divorce. I actually don't see the correlation between these two things. Is, if Obama wants gay marriage, that really has nothing to do with communists supporting divorce. I don't see the connection between these two things. This is, this is really just an, a pathetic attempt to link Barack Obama to communists when really these things really aren't even all that related. Now he's moving on to somehow prove that Barack Obama is communist or following a communist line because of his flip-flop stance on abortion. That brings me to abortion. The Bolsheviks advocated abortion. It was one of the first things they legalized. Obama sometimes supports abortion. He's also been anti-abortion in the past. So, therefore, he's a communist because only a communist would support abortion. Unlike anarchists and libertarians who also support abortion. So, they must be communists by your logic as well. By the early 1920s, Bolshevik Russia had the most liberal abortion policies in the world. And what happened? Just like divorce, abortion exploded. Once again, all this guy has proven that once something becomes illegal, people are going to do it. Again, I don't see what the point of pointing this out actually is. When they legalized drinking and got rid of prohibition, a lot more people drank. Duh. Again, I don't know what point he's trying to make about this. Abortion is necessary for women's rights and women's reproductive health. That's why they made it something that they wanted to do, because it was necessary for women's health. Health is science. Science is something Christian fundamentalists don't like. In fact, the proliferation of abortions was so bad that it shocked Planned Parenthood founder Margaret Sanger during a trip to Russia in 1934. By the 1970s, when America was just getting around to legalizing abortion, the Soviet Union was averaging 7 million abortions per year, dwarfing the very worst rates in America post Roe v. Wade. The direct effect on the Russian population has been staggering. Great. So. Now Stalin and Lenin are responsible for 50 million dead in gulags, 27 million in World War II, because of course, somehow, right-wing Christian fundamentalists always end up blaming them and not Hitler for World War II. Now, they've managed to get 7 million a year on average dead fetuses. So now we have an entirely new claim of a genocide by the Soviets. And I would really, really like a source on how this terribly affected the Soviet population. 
what this actually did, because you don't actually cite any negative effects that happened to the population as a result of abortions being available. You don't actually say anything. And while we're speaking about sources, you provide absolutely no source whatsoever for 7 million fetuses being aborted. None. In fact, your only source on that is quoting yourself in your own work on Margaret Sanger, the Soviets and Democrats, which in that work you also claim the 7 million on average and do absolutely nothing to back it up. For the record, Russia's horrific abortion rates are common in communist countries, which to this day lead the world in abortions. Another baseless claim. Now, in the past, that was true, because communist countries were one of the few that actually had abortions. So, of course, the abortion rate is going to be higher in a country that has legalized abortions. Now, here's some facts on abortion today. In reality, the highest abortion rate is in South America, where the only communist country is Cuba. Because it's provided and an option to women where it is harder to get in other Latin American countries, if at all. If it was more accessible in these capitalist countries, the rates would be a lot higher there. Cuba, only higher by virtue of its availability. The next highest rate of abortion, which is almost the same as Latin America, is Africa, in which it is entirely capitalist. Whether capitalist or communist right now, it's almost the same. In Latin America, 95% of abortions were unsafe. Nearly all safe abortions occurred in the, in the Caribbean, primarily in Cuba and several other countries where the law is liberal and safe abortions are accessible. The rates are almost the same. Your point is almost completely moot. Marx, to my knowledge, did not deal with abortion. To think he would have in the mid-19th century is unrealistic. However, his disciples and the international communist movement a century later certainly did, including here in America. To cite just one example, Whitaker Chambers noted how abortion was, a common, was commonplace in party life. He honestly and painfully wrote about his wife's first pregnancy when she had to plead for the life of their unborn child. Uh, the blessed birth of that child changed Chambers completely, particularly regarding his views on God. Ah, so, by virtue of the story that may have happened, because I actually couldn't find anything on it, really? This means communists try to force abortion on people, or try to force women to have abortions. And then, of course, he resorted to religion right afterward. Interestingly, the termination of an unborn life was no mystery to Chambers' nemesis, Alger Hiss. Hiss's wife, Priscilla, who aided him in his treason, had an abortion before she met him. For the record, it devastated her. So, basically, what he's trying to say here is that someone is a traitor for being a communist, and also, he's trying to link traitors to having abortions. So that if you have an abortion, you're a traitor to your country, and you hate the troops, and you should go back to wherever you came from, usual conservative argument. As to President Obama, he is far and away the most radical supporter of abortion to ever step in the White House. This audience needs no proof of that. Of course, they never do. From here on out, he actually lists uh, several reasons why Barack Obama is uh, pro-abortion. Uh, however, leaving out everything he did that was anti-abortion to paint a one-sided picture. Now, I don't have time to go into every single instant in which he was anti-abortion. However, I did leave some links in the description to go into that. Overall, Barack Obama's support of gay marriage and abortion constitute an undermining of the historical, fundamental understanding of the human family. And that, too, is quintessentially Marxist communist. Actually, it undermines the traditional religious conception of marriage. It is not the fundamental, as religion did not invent marriage, actually. We actually had it before we had religion, and anthropologists have proven that. Um, it is not strictly the work of communists, because anarchists support these things too, and so do libertarians as well, and neither of them are communists. That is not to say Obama is sitting in the Oval Office with a copy of the Communist Manifesto on his lap and a checklist of items. No, it's just that you and people like you simply imply it all the time. Now, this was an, an absolutely, completely dishonest work by this man that ignored the really existing material conditions of the world and, well, any kind of academic honesty or facts. He's basically Bible-worshipping 
and drawing inaccurate conclusions to portray Barack Obama as a communist, despite the fact that he has done pretty much everything the financial elite, the capitalist class, could actually ever want him to do. Now, because of this blatant Bible thumping that he is doing in this work, it always reminds me of Mao's work, Opposed Book Worship, where he said, no investigation, no right to speak. Unless you have investigated the problem, you will be deprived of the right to speak on it. Isn't that too harsh? Not in the least. When you have not probed into a problem, into the present facts and its past history, you know nothing of its essentials. Whatever you say about it will undoubtedly be nonsense. Talking nonsense solves no problems, as everyone knows. So why is it unjust to deprive you of the right to speak? Quite a few comrades always keep their eyes shut and talk nonsense. And for a communist, this is disgraceful. How can a communist keep his eyes shut and talk nonsense? According to the American thinker and Paul Kengor, no investigation, featured writer.